Okay then, so let's get started. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Jonathan Wiseman and I'm a principal consultant at uh, RISTEC based in the UK. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and welcome to this RISTEC webinar, which is the sixth of what is the fifth series we've been running since May last year. We asked you during the last webinar series as to what topics you'd like us to cover in this fifth series. And as a result, we will be presenting on the eight most popular requests. And the sixth of, of the, those topics is the subject of today's webinar, which is about failure modes and effects analysis. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. So hopefully we can provide some useful and practical insights for you. You also requested that the webinar should be slightly longer to cover a bit more detail, and therefore we've extended them to take an hour with about 45 minutes for the main presentation itself and then following up uh, for some questions and answer session for around 15 minutes after the main presentation. So firstly, a quick spot of housekeeping. We've muted everybody so, so that the sound won't be distorted by background noise. If you'd like to ask any questions, and we really do encourage you to ask questions, then please use the questions and answers function, the Q&A function um, at the bottom of the screen. Uh, just click on the speech bubble in the middle of the controls at the bottom of your screen. To keep it simple, please don't use the chat function. And I'll be keeping track of questions and we'll aim to cover as many of them as, as we can at the end of the session and within the hour we have available. Okay, so now I'd just like to very quickly uh, and briefly introduce Risk Tech for those of you who don't know us. Apologies if you've already heard this a dozen times before, I will be very quick. At Risk Tech, we help to manage health, safety, environmental security and business risk, it's typically in sectors where the impact of loss is high. And we offer a number of services for these sectors, including consulting, learning and training, resourcing, inspection and research and development. Okay, so now I'd just like to introduce you to our speaker today, Andy Lidston. So Andy is a principal consultant based in Ristex Warrington office. Andy, he has over 30 years of experience across a wide range of industries, including oil and gas, mining, nuclear and defense, transport, manufacturing and chemical sectors. And more recently, Andy has been heavily involved in carbon capture and storage projects. So over the past 20, uh, 25 years, Andy's work has primarily been in the oil and gas industries, covering um, both upstream and downstream facilities. And, and his experience includes techniques such as bow ties, fault and event training analysis, failure, failure modes and effects analysis, consequence modeling, hazard identification, and, and development and rollout of HC cases. So as you can see, Andy has uh, an impressive uh, breadth of experience and background. Okay, so now it's time to get started on the main presentation itself. So Andy, um, I, will, I will now hand over to you. Thank you very much, John. Um, it sounds an awful lot more impressive on paper than I do in, in real life. And if I'd known that we were going to use that photograph for all of these publicity shots, I probably would have taken my safety specs off. But at least I've been safe in the workplace. Okay, so yeah, for, for this afternoon's call um, webinar, we're going to talk about um, the basics of FMEF, failure modes and effects analysis. Um, as you can see up there, what we're concerned about is looking at how things can go wrong, how we're going to know about those things that can go wrong, what the effects of those things might be, and then to be able to use that approach to, to help improve, um, in, improve all aspects of our, um, our operation. Failure modes and effects analysis, although it originally came up as a, 
I think as a safety topic, which is something we'll cover on later, it, it's quite applicable to a, a number of areas, and particularly in India. Sort of, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Could you speak a bit louder, please? Yes, certainly. Um, sorry, it's my try on retiring later. Um, so, uh, yeah, so as I was saying, that um, failure modes and effects analysis, although it originated within the, uh, the safety areas, uh, I'm trying to prevent unwanted uh, failures causing effects on the safety of our operations. It's, it's moved uh, and has a number of operation, uh, applications within other areas, such as quality, uh, production, um, uh, and those sorts of areas, and, and making sure that we understand and we have, have the opportunity to identify what, as I said, what can go wrong and what those effects would be. So. As you can see up there, the, the key things are the, the failure mode. What are the things that can go wrong? If something can go wrong, then what will its effects be at that point? And the, uh, the analysis part, if you like, of it, uh, it's um, FMEA is a, it's a bottom up approach primarily. And um, when we say, when we, people are talking about top down, bottom up approaches, Top down is looking at how a system might fail and then what are the causes of that. Whereas a bottom up approach is looking at the individual component, the individual subsystem, the system itself, and then what, uh, what the effects of that can be. So we're starting from the base level and working our way upwards at that point. And there are, there are pluses and minuses to both approaches. And so you know, FMEA is a, is a well utilized technique for um, bottom-up technique. It may be in some cases that you actually will be using a, a top-down um, type technique and, or some combination of the both of them to, to bring us together at that point. Well, it says that you can see on the bottom of the screen there, so this, this phrase that identification of corrective actions to really ensure that it will not go wrong. Please don't take that, please don't log out of this um, uh, webinar and just assume that that's the end point of it. Um, we were, I'm definitely going to have to come back to that statement at the end of this. So that's what we're trying to achieve through within, within FMEA. Um, I, I'm not going to go through all of these, these definitions, um, but you know, there's some of the key aspects is that we're, as, as I sort of briefly explained, we're, we're looking at the function of pieces of equipment, we're looking at the functions of items, we're looking at the functions of systems. And then we're looking at how they can fail, the failure mode, how it can fail to do what we expect it to do. And then to at least ask ourselves, well, why does that occur? What are the, what are the causes of those things? And if we can understand the causes, we might be in a position of being able to uh, address those causes and to stop that failure from occurring. But if we also, we, can, we also want to start looking at the effect. What if this thing goes wrong? Does it need improvement? Does it matter if this thing goes wrong? Can we can we live with the effects of that failure, or would it lead us into a dangerous state? So we can start asking ourselves, well, what are the effects of it? And depending on what we're trying to get out of the the analysis, we might be looking at the local effect on the, the actual component itself, or we might be looking at the the global effect on the, the function of the overall organism, the function of the overall process, or something at that point. And again, depending on the, what we want to get out of this, we might be looking at how we know there's a problem. How, how, if something has failed, does it? Um, do are we aware that there is a, a, a failure that has happened? And this is where you will hear some people start talking about revealed failures, the failures we know about, and the unrevealed failures. And a lot of the times, the unrevealed failures might actually be the more dangerous ones because those. An unrevealed failure might mean that a safeguarding system is, is not in an operational state. Uh, an unrevealed failure on, say, on a pressure relief valve would mean that we don't know that the pressure relief valve is not functioning, but when we actually challenge the integrity of the system and, and place a demand for the pressure relief valve to fail, it doesn't perform at that point. So unrevealed failures and, uh, can be a, a significant uh, outputs from an FMA. It tells us these are the things we need to worry about. These are the things we, we need to put in detection that values for there. I'm going to talk very loosely throughout all of this um, just about the term FMA. 
you will find that there's a lot of other uh, acronyms that are used at various other times. The most common ones you may also come across, FMICA, failure modes, effects, and criticality analysis. Largely exactly the same basic process as an FMEA, but for each failure effect, each um, we're then assessing the criticality. And again, that criticality might be in terms of the, the functionality of the overall system. Does it, the, the system stop functioning at that point? And another one that um, comes up very often is, is FMEDA, failure modes, effects, and diagnostic analysis. Um, and particularly, uh, this is an importance within the, the functional safety field because the diagnostics part of it, as I was saying, that allows us to start looking at dangerous failures and non-dangerous failures, revealed failures and non-dangerous, uh, and non-revealed failures. And that, again, can be part of the, the, the specification for, um, as part of the, the, the functional requirements of, of, of safety devices. So, FMEA has been around for a long time. I, I can't claim any a uh, huge amount of historical knowledge in the, um, with regards to this particular slide. A lot of it's cribbed from Wikipedia, um, so please take me uh, with, it, with a pinch of salt. I, I know, you know from experience and from reading around in other places that, yes, one of the, the earliest um, applications of FMEA does appear to be in the, the US Department of Defense, where we're trying to uh, look at why uh, shells, when, why they got so many dull shells, um, which always sort of tickles me slightly in that uh, we're trying to make safer, more effective shells, and in the same way that um, one of the, uh, the historical quirks of fault tree analysis, which is a different tool, is that that was trying to make safer nuclear weapons. Anyway, um, so it, it's been around since the, the early 1940s as a, as a uh, structured method for doing things. And since that point, as you can see, it moved into um, to, to NASA. It was part of the, um, the, the failure, uh, the, the safety programs for a number of the uh, launches, the number of the programs that NASA has run. NASA um, you know, was being sort of at the forefront of our safety analysis at this point. So it moved from there into other areas. There's a, a reference to NASA writing papers for um, the offshore industry as to the use of FMEA within the offshore industry. And it's moved out from there. You can see an awful lot in here talking about the automotive industry. Because the automotive industry is going to be very interested in what can go wrong on their vehicles. What things do they need to, to worry about? What do they um, need to, to possibly engineer better? Um, what, what things do they need to um, provide better warranties for? What things do they need to provide lesser warranties for? And from, from my personal experience, I've always come across and used uh, FMEAs within the nuclear industries uh, and also within the, the offshore industries um, to look at have people coming back to this and how things can go wrong and how things can fail. And it's a, you know, as I say, it's a widely used technique. It's not tied to any one particular industry at any one point. So the FMEA allows us to start looking at where things can go wrong, to understand what the, um, the, the effects of those failures might be. And it's one of the things to, to um, I suppose to keep on stressing at this point that although the, the, the basic idea of FMEA, what can go wrong, what does it do, how do we know about it, how do we guard against it, you know, that's the basic steps which we'll come on to later. The, the amount of detail that you go into and the, the inputs, the outputs that you use within a fault tree, within a, an FMEA rather, is going to be very much dependent on yourself. What do you want to actually get out of this? And particularly when you're talking there about the, uh, assessing the safety, uh, but also looking at the reliability and the availability of systems. Now, these might be, you want you might want to be getting a quantitative judgment out of this. And, and so a, 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 a we think it's highly likely that something will fail, or it may just be that you just want to, to understand what the, what the potential mechanism might be. But equally, it might be that you want to do a, a numerical assessment coming out of this. So if we know all of the 
Um, the, the individual failures within a, an overall system that we know all of those failures and how they might result in failure on the system, and we know how often each of those individual components can fail, then we can we can do a, a simple estimate of what the uh, the likely um, probability of failure of the system is, how, how what the uptime is going to be, the availability, uh, how many hours per year is actually going to work out. It can work. We can develop that into then saying, well, okay, so if I know how often something is going to fail, and I know uh, what do I need to have as my spares holders? What are the, 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 the equipment that might need, um, I need to have on immediate standby as opposed to this, the things that we can withstand a failure and allow for something to be delivered to us? Um, and so we can use both FMEA both qualitatively and quantitatively. The key thing within FMEA is it's a structured approach. It's, it's taking a logical approach to working through step by step to look at what can go wrong, what is the effective going to be. And as it says up there, so that we can identify the things that are important, the things that are going to break our desired end state, if you like. So I think I've covered most of this already, but it's trying to make things better. It's, it's, I tend to think of it primarily as a, uh, a design tool to improve things, but equally it can be as a, and, and that might be the design of a process, the design of a, a particular product, going back to what I said about the, its reliability, that might equally be now looking at the, um, the reliability, the, adequacy of our testing plans. Do we need to test things more often to, to prove that they are in, in a state that is going to continue to work? We might also be looking at, um, rather than something that fails completely, we might also be looking at um, partial failure modes. It's something um, we could say that uh, we might be looking at a production process and a, a valve might be part of our production valve process, and that this might partially open, that might be its failure mode, it partially opens or partially closes when we ask it to, to fully close. And that might lead to contamination of the system, which in turn might lead to a financial loss because our system is not going to, our, our, our output is not going to um, be what we expected it to be. And as I said at the beginning, with this idea of revealed and unrevealed failures, if, we, if those are the questions we're asking of the system, those are the questions we're asking when we're doing the FMEA, then that allows us to look at what do we need to have in place? What are our diagnostics going to be at that point? So FMEA applies a lot of places throughout the process. As I said, I tend to think of it mostly as a uh, designing a new product, a new process, um, but a lot of, the, a lot, my, I suppose my, my second most common application in my career um, with FMEA has been in terms of accident investigation, of looking at why something, so something has gone wrong, and then to go back and to look at what things um, cause that, well, and to help the, the accident investigation process, if you like, to, to try and reconstruct the accident, starting from the ideal situation of what it was supposed to be doing, and then to look at what the, the potential failures could be to lead to our, um, our outcome at that point. So we can use it, but as I said, a lot, a lot of, most of the time it's used looking at it from the design of a process. Um, we can look at it for modifications. If we want to change something, is it going to change at that point? Is it going to, um, can we improve upon this? Are there weaknesses within our system that we can improve? It, it applies throughout the life cycle, although I would say yes, it tends to be, in, in my sort of knowledge or experience, tends to be more uh, skewed towards the, the design end of things, but yeah, applies to all of it. One of the, the key things, though, is that you know, it is customizable. We're going to start, what you get out of it is going to be proportional to, to what you put into it. So if we were looking at doing FMEAs in the early concept design stages or something, we're going to have fairly coarse FMEAs that don't have an awful lot of information, but they might start telling us these are the things we need to worry about for the next phase. If we're looking for doing an FMEA during 
the, the detailed design phase of, of a process or of a product. And then we have a lot more information and we're using it to proof test that it's uh, we do what it needs to do. We can um, we can use that to to um, evaluate its reliability. And so we, we produce a, a lot more detailed output at that point. Um, so you know, the, the, the depth and the output of the, um, the FMA will be in a, a large part is going to be proportional to the, um, the input information that's available to us. Okay, so who should be involved? The, this one, I, I was chatting with a couple of my colleagues before we started this, or as you know, the, the preparation for this. You know, uh, th this is a bit of an open-ended one. Um, traditionally, um, FMEAs have very much been <laughs> regarded as a, uh, a single person activity. I and mean, one of the things you, you fre frequently come across is people say, well, FMEAs are, are cheaper than HAZOPs because HAZOPs, we've got to get 10 people stuck in a room for a long period of time and get them to, to, to do the HAZOP, and that takes uh, a lot of man hours to do. Whereas FMEAs, you just stick an engineer in a dark room and let him toddle away with it, and so it's a lot cheaper at that point. There's pluses and minuses to, to this, uh, as to whether or not FMEAs are done as a team basis or as, a, uh, as an individual's basis. Um, there, and you know, the, the plus point, if we're doing it as a team basis, you've got a lot more experience and a lot more knowledge, a lot more challenging of the design, the process to, uh, to occur at that point. Um, but there is going to be time and, and cost considerations of that uh, associated with that. Um, doing it as sort of one or two people, that's more than one person, one person generally. Uh, if you're doing it as a single person, then um, the, the cost of the time might be a lot, uh, might be, uh, will be reduced, but you are suffering a little bit more uh, in terms of the, the very much beholden to the knowledge, the experience of that one individual at that point. So, um, as I said, it, it is you know, pluses and minuses for that. So, sort of like this background to the ideas behind the FMEA. I'd like to, to step through the, the basic steps, if you like, of an FMEA at, at this point. So, just to, to reiterate, the, the, the key things about the FMEA, it's there to, to help us understand what can go wrong, why that thing happens. So the failure modes, what, what can go wrong, the causes of those failure modes, why that thing happened, and then to look at their effects of, uh, with that. And that's, if you like that, that's gonna be the, the simplest the application that you can do of a, an FMEA. You can then start looking at the um, assessing the level of risk. Uh, as I said, that might be qualitative or it might be quantitative. And so that would be a, a more detailed FMA. But one of the key things is you, you have to, as part of the preparation side for doing an FMA, you've got to start asking yourself, what do I want to get out of this? What, what is the information I need? What do I need to collect? What do I, how, how detailed do I need to, for this to be, such that you can make sure that the output of your FMEA is going to be useful. And one of the key areas, again, within this, as with any risk review process, any product improvement, any quality improvement process, is that we are looking to think, make things better. FMEA is as vulnerable to as any other risk assessment process that if you're just doing it to get a tick in the box to say, I've done this, now please give me my certificate, then you're not going to get much useful out of it. We're doing these things to improve. So there have to be corrective actions to allow us to improve the process and the design at that point. So roughly speaking, you know, I tend to think of it, and, or let's say, uh, yeah, I tend to think of FMEA as like a, uh, it's a hazard for mechanical systems. Uh, it's all the same sort of basic approach. We're very, very used, used to, to doing hazards on the, the flow of processes through 
containment, and an FMEA is, if you like, a, a close relative, which is looking at the um, using of um, the, the technique to look at mechanical electrical systems, but it can be widely, more widely um, used as well at that point. The science, particularly with the vast hazard, there is some crossovers between that. And there's some places where you might find, yes, I, I could do a hazard on this, or I could do an FMA on it. And um, both approaches would work equally well. So, the first step with doing the, uh, this is to, to look at, is it, it, to describe the scope of the FMA. As I said, what do you want to get out of this? Um, and you know, well, what are the boundaries of my analysis? Am I looking at the entirety of the process? Am I just looking at one particular aspect of it? Am I looking at the service systems that supply my process? Am I looking at the, um, am I looking at it in a particular mode of operation? Because, you know, there may be, well be um, pieces of equipment, systems that operate in different ways at different times within the life cycle. And it's critical for us to understand what the boundaries of our analysis are going to be, what the desired endpoints, what do you want to get out of this, and also the, the, the modes of the operations. So, um, and uh, talking there about the, the purpose and the objectives, as I said, what do you want to get out of it? Do you want numerical values? Do you want to understand the diagnostics? Or do you want to understand the um, how long a piece of equipment would be offline if it were to fail? All of these might be potential outcomes that can come out of this basic process at that point. But it's a critical, this is a critical step. Um, you've got to understand what it's supposed to do, because what you are now going to do is to try to break this system, this item. So if you don't understand what it's supposed to be doing, it makes it incredibly hard for you to then produce a comprehensive analysis that says this is how it's going to fail. So it's critical that you, know, you can't just pick up a, um, a, a drawing, a, a, a layout or whatever it is that is going to be part of the, the study. You can't just pick it up and say, okay, I'm going to start at this. Um, what's this component? What is it? How might it fail? You have to understand how the whole system works, what the different variations within that system are going to be um, within that. So, to start with what we're going to do and then as with most other things it makes sense to um to do this in a, in a logical approach you start at the beginning and you work your way through a component at a time at that point which takes us then on to the the next stage you know to break the system down into components to break it down into individual parts now this is going to be, um, this is, I think, in my experience, is where most people start to struggle with regards to the, the idea of an FMEA. Is as to what are we, how, how, how low do we break it down? And into how many small parts do we actually break down the system? Now, part of this is going to be determined by the, uh, the, the objectives of this. What do, you, what do you want to find out? Um, but equally, part of it might also be determined by the, the level of data that is available to you. If you, if you only have uh, system level data, then there's no point in you worrying about individual fuses. Whereas if you're looking to improve the reliability of a, um, a, a minor component, a, a programmable logic, logic circuit within a, um, a control system, then we might go down and we might have data available to us at the, the transistor level. I mean, if you were to go back to the automotive industry, so if somebody was to say, well, okay, so you know, we want to do an FMEA on a car. So you can say, oh, okay, the car is broken down into uh, systems. There's the, uh, the, the powertrain, there's the steering, there's the brakes, there's the body shell. Okay, so how might the engine fail? Uh, okay, so the, the engine might fail to start, it might fail to run, it might fail to meet its emission targets. And so you could do an FMEA on the engine as a single component. Or you could say, well, okay, so uh, perhaps I need to be in a, a bit more detail than that. So I, I break the engine down. Well, what's the, the component parts within the engine? Well, there's the, the, there's the fuel supply system, there's the combustion system, there's the electrical system, there's the gearbox. 
Uh, that's the transmission system. Okay, so how might the fuel su supply system fail? Well, it might produce too lean a mixture, it might produce too rich a mixture, it might not produce any mixture whatsoever. It may, it may, um, it, it may be blocked. Uh, so or those might be potential failure modes of the fuel supply system. But then you can, also, you can go down into a, a little bit more detail than that, saying, okay, so the fuel supply system, you've got a carburetor, well, that's composed of um, a, uh, the vein within the carburetor. Now that has two springs associated with it that will um, control the position of the, the, um, the vein. Well, what if the spring fails? What if the, the springs are too tight? What if the spring is too loose? And to look at the individual components within that, and so you're, you're, you're going down in if you like an orders of magnitude of detail at this point. You've got to, to start asking yourself before you start launching into this, how detailed are we going to be at that point? What is my lowest level of interest? And a, a rough rule of thumb might, might be the, the lowest replaceable part um, or the, the, the level of detail that is shown within the the description, the drawing that you are actually working for to do the FMEA. Um, and, and, but be prepared to, to modify that, be prepared to change that at that point. So we start with identifying the, the overall function, we start looking at the individual components, and then you've got to start asking yourself again, what is the, what is the functionality of this component? What does it have to do? Once we know what something has to do, how might it fail? What is its failure mode? So this tends to be, you know, um, you know phrases like it fails to operate, it fails to open, it fails to open fully, it fails to close, um, it fails to pass current. So it, you know, I'm not going to say it's 100% um, guidance, but you know, using the word it fails to do something, it, it, it's part of that's what we're trying to find out within the, the failure mode. Now, this might be based around your knowledge, it might be based around your experience, and this is particularly where doing it as a team-based activity might be useful. Um, but equally, you can start looking at databanks, um, component failure information books. They, they will, again, will give you potential failure modes of equipment. Uh, one that, a book that I use very often within the, the offshore industry is called Amida, the Offshore Reliability Equipment Data Analysis. And that, that will give you components like pumps, valves, etc. And then it will give you the, the potential failure modes of those, of those components. Um, similarly, the, uh, the non-electric reliability parts data book, which is another source of reliability data, will also give you different types of, of failures um, that a, a particular piece of equipment might have. So we've looked at the component, how can it fail? Once we are sort of looking at this, this component, this type of failure, for each individual failure, why does it happen? What's causing it to fail? Might be that it's just um, you know, breakage of the system, it might be wear and tear, but equally it might be external influences. Something might fail because there is so, no signal to it. It might fail because there's no motive power to it or something like that. So, so it might be that the causes are, um, if you like, intrinsic to the component itself, or it might be that they are external um, causes at, at that point. Um, again, this is very much going to come back to uh, your knowledge and your experience at that point. So you, you're going to have, uh, for each failure mode, there may be multiple failure causes at that point. And if we are interested in a, uh, a, a risk score, if you like, or a numerical values coming out of this, then we need to start asking ourselves at that point, or we need to be uh, collecting the data at that point, what is the cause, what is the, the probability uh, of this? And that might be in terms of the, um, the failure rate per hour, it might, be a, 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 or it might just be a probability, or it might just be a value on a risk matrix. You know, uh, um, um, again, we can, we can customize the FMEA to the amount of data that we've got within it. But we can start asking ourselves, well, what is the, the likelihood that this cause will result in this failure mode. Know that, then the next question is to start asking ourselves, well, what is 
the um, the local what is for this failure mode largely wants the, the we're, we're more interested in what the failure mode is going to be the, for this failure mode for these causes what is the effect and we'll be looking at the local effect on the component itself and also the global effect on the entire process and um, there may be more than one effect at this point um, it might depend on what the mode of operation is at that point etc and so we can ask ourselves then is well what is the, the severity now, is it is it a partial failure? Is it a complete failure? It might be um, in terms of the the number of hours of downtime that we might uh, get from this particular this failure at that point. So for this failure mode, for this component, this this is the how it fails. This is why it fails. This is what happens when it does fail. How do we know about it? How what might so? How do we know we've got a problem? Might be sensors tell us it might be that the first thing we know about it is that the the process stops. Well, fine if we're doing another process, but if we're dealing with something that's a uh, a standby safety device, then you know the, we don't want for that to be the first time we know that something's failed is when it fails to do its job. So look at the um, the means of detection, whether or not it is or isn't going to be detected at that point. And also, we might be looking at safeguards and mitigation at this point. And um, you know, if this piece of equipment fails, oh, fine, we've got redundancy within the system. There's a second pump that will automatically start up and do that job at that point. So there may be safeguards um, associated with that. There may be the safeguards that prevent a safety act. Um, thing from a safety event from happening, so that we have guarding around something that means that an unwanted event is not going to cause harm at that point. We can again look at the the likelihood that those controls will or, or won't work at that point. Then, do we are, can we live with this? As it's acceptable to us, do we need to do anything more and to raise uh, raise actions at that point? Um, I put detection up there as um, in, in, in sort of like italics. I've used both approaches at various times. So you, you can just say that risk is frequency and severity times occurrence. Sometimes it's more beneficial to say so that risk is going to be severity times occurrence times detection. Um, both approaches work um, depending again on what your outputs, desired outputs are going to be. Once we've done that, for the, this particular failure mode, then we can start looping back around. Is there any more failure modes for this particular component? Are there any more, the next component, the next system? And just loop back down all the way through until we've completed the FMEA. FMEAs tend to be um, tabulated. You can see various sort of tabulations here. So you, you're looking at the, um, the tag number. The, yeah, we need the same sort of quality expectations you would have with doing a HAZOP to look at. We have to be able to identify an individual component um, uh, such that anybody else can pick up this and follow their way through this. What it has to do is potential failure, what the effects of it will be, the causes, the prevention, the detection, etc. You know, so you've got 10, 12 different columns in there. That's probably going to be as detailed as it ever gets to, uh, as you might want to go. Equally, you might only be interested in what are the effects, what are the causes, um, and what are the modes. So you might finish up with only doing about three or four columns. As I said, you've got to start asking yourself before you start doing the FMEA what you want to get out of it, and that's going to help you with the how many of these um, columns you need to include and what information you need for that. So there's some sort of examples for this. You know, um, this is one where um, a client had a, um, a pump lift sensor, two air operated diaphragm pumps. One of them failed, the diaphragm failed on this, which led to a contamination of the system. So as part of the incident investigation to go back and to look at the, all of the components within this, to ask ourselves, is there anything else that needs to be improved within this design? Anything else, uh, are, we, are there other potential things that can go wrong in the future? 
Equally, you could say, well, you know, we can probably uh, approach this with that as a hazard for that point. Um, again, you know, somebody else might have done it in that approach. And so an example of that, we have the, the, the output, or partial output of that. And again, you can see that there's a fair amount of information that's recorded within this of what are we trying to do? So we've got the components, what it has to do, the potential failure mode, what the effects of that would be, and also the additional information in there. Another potential, uh, another one, this, this was uh, this is a colleagues of mine, it's not actually mine, um, we was looking at a, um, a cremation company, which is a, a novel thing for those of us who mostly work within the high hazard industry, but it was looking at, um, looking at, so the, the previous one was looking at incident investigation, a post failure, this was looking at improving the design of a, uh, the, cremate, the door into the cremation chamber, and looking at changing that from a mechanical system to a hydraulic system. And again, to go through and to check the, the design intent and would it be, do what we needed it to do. You can see here then that the, the output of this is slightly less detailed than the previous one. But it's still working through the same basic approaches. What do we want to have? How might it fail? What is the, the causes? What's the effects? And how would we know about it and any safeguards at that point? For those of, uh, of us who are doing these things for, as I said, for, for numerical values, um, if we want to do it as a availability or reliability, which might be important within a process system, then you would have, again, additional columns at the end of this. So that was, a, if you like, a very quick run through on, on the, the basic ideas behind FMEA. FMEA key benefits, it's a very structured, methodical approach. You're going through component by component and asking yourself what can go wrong, what are the effects going to be? Okay, if we know this and we start asking ourselves how things can go wrong, we can start improving it. It gives us more information about the processes. It tends to be you know, Ed moved, applied more towards the mechanical and the electrical systems in my experience, but there are plenty of other places where it can also be applied as well. I, I've used, I've seen people use it with regards on a, um, a, a task step, you know, as part of like safety critical task analysis. The operator is supposed to do this, what if he does something wrong? What would, why might he, why might the operator do something wrong? What would be the effects of the operator doing something wrong? Now, from my, my human factors colleagues would say, yes, that's a safety critical analysis, task analysis. For me, it's just an FMEA of a human. You could equally do an FMEA of a, of, of a process, or of, a, of a procedure. I don't know, the, the, the procedure says, do this. Well, this is the intent of that step in the procedure. What if that step in the procedure is not done? If it's done too early, if it's done too late, what would the effects be at that point? Would we know about it? Would it lead us to a, a, hard, a dangerous hard place? I suppose in theory, you could also do it for computer programming, although personally, I've never got to that, that point. Key thing though, it's a customizable, logical, structured approach to asking ourselves what can go wrong. Potential limitations associated with it. It's only going to be as good as the input information. It's only going to be as good as the input knowledge. Um, if we don't keep it up to date with the way that we run the system, the plant, the design, it's going to be a waste of time. So it's as vulnerable to that as any other structured um, uh, technique. Um, it can be time consuming, but um, as um, Trevor Clips once said, if you think safety is expensive, try having an accident. If you think that um, performing an FMAA is expensive, how much is it going to cost you to recall an entire batch of um, contaminated foodstuffs? Um, so you know, time consuming and expensive is going to be a relative thing. Um, it is very vulnerable to um, being very focused. You're, you, you tend to be looking at one component at a time. Um, so it's very difficult sometimes to, to think of well, what happens if multiple failures occur. 
or if this has failed, well, then might this introduce a, a failure mode that causes something else to fail? So one of the, the problems in, in inverted commas you can have with FMA is you become so focused on the individual component, you, can, you, you lose sight of the, uh, the bigger picture. That really comes down to, to experience and being aware that it can actually happen at that point. So FMEA, as I've said multiple times, we've gone through this, it's identification of anything that can go wrong. Asking ourselves what can go wrong. And as I said at the beginning, what, you know, it will not go wrong. We're never going to stop something happening. Things are always going to break. That's why most of the law is here. So what can go wrong will go wrong, but we should be in a better place to deal with it. So hopefully, if we've done the FMA best well, what, will, what can go wrong will go wrong, but it will happen less often and or with less impact at that point. That's what we want to be in the position of doing it with all of this. So I've gone three minutes over. I apologize for that. Um, um, I apologize for the sound quality at the beginning. Um, but uh, if I can hand it over to you then, John. Yep, uh, excellent. Uh, thank you, Andy. Uh, yeah, and again, I apologize for some of the audio, audio issues uh, there at the start. I um, hope you managed to hear uh, the content sufficiently there. Um, so looking to review that for the next webinar. Uh, so now we've got the got the chance to answer some of the questions that have come in, and there have been quite a few, which is good. Uh, the first question is from Tahir, um, and it is, what is the criteria to define frequency? What is the criteria to define frequency to perform cyclic FMEAs like after how many years? So I think this question's around: is there a, is there a requirement to review our FMEA, or if not, what 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 what's what's the guidance or what's um, what's the recommendation yes, around it's, that? It's an interesting question. I mean, there, there is a a rough rule of thumb that you come across very often is that uh, and it tends to be more applied to hazards, as it were, to, than it does to, to FMEAs. Um, it, um, that you would revalidate a hazard every five years. Um, and the same could also apply to a, um, an FMEA. Now, I'm not aware of any rigid guidance for that. Um, it would be prudent to, to revalidate the FMEA as part of uh, a management of change procedure if, the, if, if something was happening. But I would be very cautious about um, looking at, about mandating a particular time frame for uh, revalidating an FMEA because an FMEA might well be done on a, a design of a, of a system or it might be, you know, the, uh, the the design of a, uh, a programmable logic, logic circuit. And if we haven't changed the design within five years, then it's useful for us to ask the question, has anything changed? But you know, individual components systems like a uh, PLC um, or a um, particular pump or an engine, we don't change these things as often as we tend to change the parameters associated with a hazard. So I think it would be useful to, to go back in and ask the question on a periodic basis and rough rule of thumb often comes out as three to five years. Is, has anything changed? Um, and to err on the side of caution if there's a possibility of going back in and revalidate at that point. Um, but I would be cautious about mandating an actual um, requirement. I can't speak for all industries in this area. But Okay, thank you, Andy. So the next question comes from Rachel, and it comes with a disclaimer, actually, which is, is perhaps a bit of a broad question. So, uh, um, yeah, it might not be the easiest question to answer, but are there any ethical issues that we may consider within an FMEA? So perhaps this is looking more at the consequences side of things. Uh, oh, well, that's a very interesting broad question. Um, 
but it got eight minutes left to talk about this. Um, ethical, inter uh, ethical things in doing an SMEA. I, I would not say there's any ethical considerations for doing an FMEA that are specific to the FMEA itself. There are the same ethical considerations that you would have with regards to doing any form of risk assessment, whether it's a hazard or anything else, um, in that there is all, there should be an expectation that you are being honest. There's no point in um, hiding potential consequences and wishing that things were never going to go, that, you know, downplaying the potential consequences um, to, to get an easier ride or to, to make people less worried about something. Uh, it's a, because that just leads to, you know, you're not actually doing anything useful with regards to this assessment process at that point. Um, equally, there is, we have to also guard against over edit overestimating what the, the consequences or the frequency might be and that tends to be more with you know people have a, a particular agenda that they are trying to push at some point um, in, in that way um so there's nothing specific for fmeas but it's a very interesting question and i'm very happy to talk it through with you later rachel but i think that is such a broad topic because we could spend hours on that <laughs> yeah indeed so yeah um another question here from Tahir, and it, it's it's a good one actually um who should lead uh, an fmea should it um so his, his, his question really is specifically to a dcs fmea i think that means digital control system perhaps um so who should lead that would it be the safety uh professional or the instrument engineer or an operations engineer which which discipline think, would would lead the, yeah. the study I think if you're doing the fmea as a um a team-based activity then the same basic principles would apply as um leading a hassle with um uh, sorry as for as for leading a hazard in that the the facilitator <coughs> The facilitator ideally should be somebody who is independent and of the the process such that they can ask the questions and that they are knowledgeable about using the process itself if you're talking about uh, the situation where you have uh, somebody is you have a single individual doing an fmea um there are pluses and minuses to whether or not it's the safety guy or the design engineer. I mean, obviously, the, the design engineer has more knowledge, um, detailed knowledge about how the, the system works, um, but they might slightly be biased towards uh, something. And that you know, design engineers, with the greatest respect, tend to assume that what they have designed is always uh, going to be perfect. And so they can discount some failure modes as being non credible. Uh, the safety engineer, if they are leading it, doing the FMA at that point, they're coming at it, uh, hopefully, going back to Rachel's question about ethics, hopefully they're coming at it as the, the honest broker and more experienced in the, uh, the process and more likely to raise detailed challenges to the design, but they're going to have to go through the learning curve um, to understand what the function is, and they may not necessarily understand all of the um the potential failure modes of something I, i'm a i'm a physicist by trade um i'm not an electrical engineer i would finish up writing you know if, if i was like doing a fmea for bcms i'm going to spend a lot of time asking an awful lot of questions at that point but i'm going to raise a lot more challenges possibly than the the, the lead design might have at that point Again, pluses and minuses. Um, in the real world, it might also be who's available um, can also be a significant input into the process. Yep. Okay, thank you, Andy. Uh, a question here from Rohit. Uh, while calculating the RPN number, uh, so I think that's the overall uh, kind of the risk score, we consider likelihood, severity, and detection. For the detection ranking, should we consider only detection measure? Or should we also take the safeguard measure into account for the calculation? It's going to depend on what you want to get out of it. If you just want to know how often, if, you, if what you want to know is how often 
the consequence is going to occur, then we probably ought to be looking at you're, you're, you're then turning this into a, a risk calculation. So we're, we're sort of erring towards a bit more uh, the, the local end of the spectrum at that point. So yes, you need to know frequency, severity, detection, and action. And so you know, detection and action becomes the, um, uh, the, the functional part of the, the safeguard. If we're just wanting to know how often something goes wrong and how bad it's going to be, then all we're going to do is frequency, probability, and severity. Uh, if we want all, if what we want to get out of it at the end of it is um, how often is something going to go wrong, and this is and this is going to lead to a reveal or unreveal failure, then it will be uh, severity, probability, and detection. Um, again, it, it's as I said when I was going through that slide. Um, all both methods work, uh, and the third method is um, you just mentioned there. They all work. Um, it's really what is going to be the most useful measure for you at the end of it, and it's important that whoever picks up or reads or is is given access to the FMEA report at the end of it can understand what actually you are measuring, because there is going to be a big difference between the number that you calculate or the risk that you calculate if you're just looking at um, probability and severity as opposed to which is going to be unmitigated risk as opposed to the mitigated risk so you need to do, if you are doing these calculations you need to make it very clear if you just include a column on the FMA that says risk that it's very clear to people what that measure of risk actually is Okay, thanks, Andy. So I think we've got time for perhaps one more question um, from Harry. Uh, what is the difference between FMEA and FMECA? Now, I know you did cover this, but perhaps yeah, uh, maybe so, a bit, bit more detail. Yeah, I mean, FMEA, failure modes and effects analysis, uh, FMECA uh, is failure modes, effects and criticality analysis. So FMEA, you're going through and you're looking at if this piece of equipment fails, the effects of this would be, and you tend to make a, if you like, a qualitative type judgment at that point as to how important that failure effect is going to be. Um, key difference with FMECA, you tend to then um, to put on a, 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 a probability and severity matrix um, within the FMEA table, such that you would say the, uh, the probability of this failure cause is this, the severity of the, of the effect, and um, that might be, generally we would tend to look at it as the, the global effect, the, the effect on the process, so that might be a, a critical, so we would assign a numerical value for that, so you might say that if you can imagine I'm waving my hands frantically at this point, but you know, if you can imagine a three by three matrix, so that you could say that the, the criticality there is um, frequent, uh, infrequent, or rare, and they would have scores of three, two, and one, and you could say critical failures have a score of three, partial failures have a score of two, and a um, no effect has a score of one, then multiplying those two together would give you a criticality value. Um, and you know that's so we can then use that to that that criticality banking to help us prioritise uh, the areas for remedial measures at that point. You will find uh, three by threes or five by five of these criticality matrices. You'll find them within um, the ISO standards, the military standards for this. I would guess you find it in the automotive standard. I can't honestly. So I've read one of those recently. Okay, yep. Thanks, Andy. So we're at uh, one minute past four now. So we've we've filled the allotted time. Um, so yeah, there are there are a few more questions. So apologies that we didn't manage to get through all of those, uh, but we do need to wrap up now. Uh, we will make a recording of this webinar available to you early next week. Um, when you leave the webinar, uh, you should automatically receive a survey in your browser. And this literally takes 30 seconds to complete. And we really, really do appreciate your, your feedback. 
If you have any further questions arising from what you've heard today or you'd like some more information on any of our services, then please do simply email us directly or feel free to visit our website and contact us through any of the forms on there instead. Uh, Andy, yep, thanks once again. And thank you everyone for your attention. We are uh, very grateful uh, for you all taking the time out of your busy schedules to listen in today. Uh, the next webinar is on route and pipeline QRAs, uh, which will we'll be looking at the risks of transportation of hazardous goods by road, rail and pipeline, and how to, and in particular, how to model these and identifying the main differences uh, between these route type QRAs and perhaps a facility QRA. And this webinar will be on the 18th of August at 6 p.m. UK time. So hopefully you can join us for that one too. And I appreciate that that one is a bit later on in the day uh, for those of you in certain parts of the world. Uh, in the meantime, please stay safe and stay secure and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you and goodbye.